Do you come across people like me too? <laughs> I feel like I create people like you. This is Dr. Ellen Vora. She's a psychiatrist who specializes in helping people with depression, anxiety, insomnia, and ADHD. Basically, that nasty mixture that keeps so many entrepreneurs and creatives feeling stuck. Dr. Vora is also the author of the groundbreaking book, The Autonomy of Anxiety. And in today's conversation, she gives us a no BS look at anxiety and how small, simple changes to sleep or nutrition, to what we think and who we spend time with, how each one of these things can help us tame the restlessness in our minds and focus on what matters most. The fact that we're living in the attention economy, which is to say our attention is the commodity being competed for by very smart companies. And they know that if they prey on our fear response or instill uncertainty or doubt or controversy, we will hand over an increasingly large share of our attention. They will get more clicks and more ad revenue. They're the big winners but our mental health is the collateral damage. If we're all anxious all the time, how do we know if this anxiety that we're constantly feeling is something that we can deal with because it's just like something we all have and we can work through it? Or if it's like real, like, like real anxiety, like the real thing, it's a real medical condition. Like, so can we just start with how do we know whether anxiety is real or hurting us or helping us or holding us back? How do we even know? Yeah, I think you're exactly right. It is the tone, it is the pH of the water we are swimming in these days. And who among us is not affected in some way by anxiety? It's the tone. And I do think that I look at this differently than my training because for the most part, I'm approached by people that are already subjectively connecting with the term anxiety. So I'm not really on the prowl being like, hey, you, you, you don't identify with anxiety and you ought to, you should be thinking more about how anxious you are. I think, you know, I want people to notice when they're suffering, whatever we're calling that suffering and make little shifts to help them feel better. But whether or not they're calling it anxiety to me is less relevant. I do think that we need a shift around the bifurcation that's currently happening right now. People are thinking, Am I clinically anxious? Is this real true blue anxiety? Does it meet criteria? Is it the yeah. real thing? Or am I just a little stressed or worried? And I don't think that's a meaningful distinction. Okay. I understand so why. I, I totally did that. You know, I I didn't know I was anxious, but I can remember having a conversation with my mom maybe like 10 years ago. And I remember saying, I just don't think it's normal to have this like this constant fear and like constant overwhelm and this like not in the pit of my stomach all day, every day. I just, I feel like other people don't feel like this. And my mom's like, oh, I don't know. And then that was, <laughs> that was it. And then like many, many years later, you know, I was like, uh, my friend's like, you need to go to therapy. You need to figure out what's going on. Cause I was just swinging from anxious to depressed to anxious to depressed and like so much. And I thought maybe I had borderline personality disorder cause I was like cycling so much during the day, like from day to day, hour to hour. And so I just, I did exactly what you said, which is like, doc, help me figure out what's wrong with me. Put a name on it so at least I can put a stamp on it. And he was like, well, you have GAD, generalized anxiety disorder. You're not this, you're not this, you're not this, you're not this. It's totally normal. And then I was like, great. Now I have a name for it. But you're saying that that's like not the thing we're supposed to do. <laughs> <laughs> kind of. I mean, I think the name for it is interesting. And in that I remember also when I was in my 20s and I was like, I meet every di you know, criteria for every diagnosis in the DSM. And I was like, oh, now I have a name for it. I found that so grounding. And I was like, oh, I have a thing. But I think that it, it suggests that it's a fixed trait. And okay. that's where I really deviate from my training is that I don't think of these diagnoses as genetic chemical imbalance handed down from on high. It's our destiny it's our identity and we're stuck. I actually think that these are much more plastic um, and states than traits. And so I think there's a lot more that we can do to change how symptomatic we are. And so I don't always love to put a label on something because I don't think that label will necessarily be valid a few months later, a few years later. And so I also think that that distinction between, you know, is this the true blue real clinical thing or just mild, whatever, we need that classification for two main reasons. One is that we need to standardize our diagnoses for clinical research. And the other is that we need to gatekeep invasive interventions. So if I'm going to give you a medication, I, I need to be right about whether you really have a diagnosis that warrants that medication. I'm not just going to put yeah. this in the water. But the way I approach mental health in general 
holistically using safe interventions, diet and lifestyle strategies, things that are accessible, free, non-invasive, very safe. There's nothing there to gatekeep. And so to me, that distinction is less important because if somebody is true blue crippled by debilitating anxiety, or they're just a little anxious, to be honest, I think everyone is suffering in a meaningful way. And so they can all try some of these strategies. If you're suffering more, you might do more. If you're suffering less, you might put a little less effort in, but we can all approach our anxiety from a holistic perspective and try to decrease our symptoms. I think it's a worthy process for everybody. So what I think I hear you saying is whether you go the route of, of me and saying like, I need to see a therapist and I need to go through all of the weeks, it was really boring, the weeks of diagnostic tools and answering surveys and you know, you're this or you're that and all of these things. Truthfully, if you feel anxious, you're anxious. And if you feel uh, maybe depressed or down, then in that moment, you're depressed and down. And and whether it's clinically there or not, or what the cause of it is, or any of those things doesn't change the fact that you feel what you feel when you feel it. And to you, that's just as real as getting a clinical definition or not. Is that is that what you're saying? So I think that there is a distinction that is what I find steers management in a meaningful way, which is the central thesis of my book, which is to basically think of anxiety as either what's called false or avoidable anxiety, and then what I call true or purposeful anxiety. And to me, that's actually where we want to focus all of that tedium and diagnostic evaluation is, are your symptoms right now caused by false or avoidable anxiety? Is this a physical state? Is something in your environment, in your diet, in your lifestyle, precipitating a stress response in the body, which then we subjectively experience as anxiety or even panic? Um, or is there something purposeful to your anxiety? You're like, is this an avoidable thing? That's not your true North. If this isn't something deep and inherent to you, it's just something physiologically out of balance. Or is this your inner compass nudging you and saying, hey, something's really not right here. Something's out of alignment. Let's course correct. And to me, the work is actually in discerning what's at play in any given moment. When it's false anxiety, we roll up our sleeves and we start to do the investigative work of identifying what is the root cause and how can we address that? When it's true anxiety, we roll up our sleeves in a really different way, which is let's get still, let's get silent. And let's tune into this and let it inform and be translated into purposeful action. Huh. I've I've heard you I, I've heard you've gotten some pushback on the idea of false anxiety just in terms of the words, but I find it so fascinating because for me, I have worked very hard over the last few years on on trying to figure this out. You know, the just the amount of anxiety, the amount of fear, the amount of impending doom and worry and whatnot that we can easily carry. And so a few weeks ago, for example, I was just feeling down a lot. And I realized, like, I love going on Reddit. Um, I love Reddit. And I realized that at some point along the way, Reddit started suggesting to me communities that I did not subscribe to. And a lot of the communities were very like, poverty is rampant and terrible. The rich are super greedy. The economy is coming to an end. We are totally fucked as a society, there is no going back. America is going to fall. And like, it's just like, and I didn't even realize that like, oh, like I'm just after a few days, I'm like, I really don't feel good. Then I was like, I have to delete, like, I have to delete all of these things from my life. And when I go on Instagram, I don't feel good. And so it's like, I just, I'm not going to go on Instagram anymore. And like, I, re- I, I've put up a few walls <laughs> because I realized these things don't make me feel good. Is that like what we're talking about when it comes to false anxiety versus maybe even true anxiety. It's just noticing these things that are kind of putting me in fight or flight mode. Yes, exactly. What you're detailing right now is one of the few sort of, it's, it's a technology version of false anxiety. And you're right. I have gotten pushed back on that term and, and I totally, I totally get why, like, it (laughs) feels like an invalidating term, right? It's saying like, what? My anxiety is not real. Like, it, and it's not to invalidate the, the anxiety. The suffering is incredibly real. It speaks to that there is a physical basis for it and a straightforward path out. Um, and we can talk more about that in a minute. But what you're noting here is what I would call the anxiety from the fact that we're living in the attention economy, which is to say our attention is the commodity being competed for by very smart companies. And they've done their homework. They know their neuroscience and their behavioral psychology. 
And they know that if they prey on our fear response or instill uncertainty or doubt or controversy, we will rubberneck. We will hand over an increasingly large share of our attention. They will get more clicks and more ad revenue. They're the big winners, but our mental health is the collateral damage. And so we have to navigate the information landscape, eyes wide open, making very conscious choices from a place of self-love about who gets to tell us what and in what way and how often and at what time of day, because it impacts our mental health. And if we want to be part of the conversation and making a meaningful impact, we need to be rested. We need to be intact. I can't wait to dig more into this. And I, and I definitely want to, but I've been curious since kind of the first moment I came across you, why did you pick anxiety? as the thing you would dedicate this part of your career to? Like, why, why this topic? Yeah, it's a, there are a couple of factors. And one is that, you know, I, I just, I wasn't, I couldn't miss the pattern. <laughs> like everyone was coming <laughs> into my office anxious. So I felt there was a big need for this. And I wanted to write also about bipolar. I, I always like writing about depression, but I think that- What a fun topic to write about. Right, this is exactly that, right? So anxiety, it's a little bit more fun. Like- I find it delightful to treat anxiety because there are really quick wins to be had. There's low hanging fruit. I think differently about anxiety than my training. And I feel like I can meet someone. They haven't heard these ideas before. I can give them a couple actionable small shifts to make in their life and they can be less anxious fairly readily. And that's really satisfying. And so like, this was just the most fun thing to approach. And then I realized there was a lot of human suffering to relieve quickly up yeah. front with approaching anxiety first. And so you even just mentioned again that you approach it so differently than than your traditional training, which focused, uh, I have to imagine, on the DDSM 5, 6, or I don't know, I don't even know the terms, whatever. The the thing that we all use to say, if you have, <laughs> if you have 7 out of 12 possible side effects, then you could classify as whatever, you know, yada, yada. But why have you, like, you very clearly feel like you found an answer. You, you've put out a book that has been extremely well received. So why are you doing this different than, than everyone else? <laughs> what do you know that everyone else doesn't seem to get? So, I mean, the DSM, apart from being a sales catalog for pharmaceuticals, essentially. Yeah, I mean, I found that it those diagnoses were limiting sometimes and they all implied that this is, that you're stuck, that you're, this is a destiny. And that's the presiding consensus on mental health writ large is to think of our mental health issues as a genetic chemical imbalance. So it's written in our genes and it's our destiny. And that's all well and good. You know, this was partly born out of psychiatry trying to be taken seriously as a science. And we wanted to be objective and we wanted to be, you know, biologically based like all the other medical professions and our medical specialties. And so, and the implication is, okay, so you have this genetic chemical imbalance that's causing your depression or your anxiety, but that's okay. We have a solution for you, which is you take this pill and it corrects the chemical imbalance and then everything will be honky dory. And the trouble is that it doesn't work that way. That's always been a story, somewhat of marketing. And what concerns me is that you know, we need to have the nuanced conversation around meds. I'm not dogmatically anti-pharma. I'm a psychiatrist. I prescribe medication and I'm a 42 year old human. Who's like been at this long enough to know anytime I get dogmatically married to one approach, like life kicks me in the teeth and tells me, <laughs> Nope, you got it all wrong and <laughs> be humble. And so I think that, um, you know, we, we need nuance to that conversation, but what concerns me is that if there's someone out there, this is the part that doesn't concern me. Actually, there are people out there for whom medications are effective. It helps them. And that's a victory. I am in favor of decreasing all human suffering. We count that as a victory. The trouble is, is that's actually a small portion of people struggling. And there are millions of people for whom medications haven't been an adequate solution, whether it's that it was effective initially and then the effect waned over time, or maybe they have a significant burden of side effects, or there's a contraindication with something else that they're taking or something else in their life. And so there are a lot of people for whom meds aren't the answer. And I think my field has been doing a disservice to people by saying, well, here's our limited menu of offerings. You've got these kinds of therapies and you've got meds. Good luck out there. Hope it works for you. And if it does, that's great. But if it doesn't, people get demoralized. They start to despair because they think, okay, I have a genetic chemical imbalance. I'm broken, but there's something that can fix it. But I've tried all the options and none of them work for me. So I'm fucked. And that's where I'm just really interested in focusing on exactly those people who are despairing and feeling like they have no hope and no options that I just want them to know 
there's absolutely reason for hope. That was a limited menu. The menu yeah. should be so much longer. We need to be talking about all the other things you can do to support your mental health, which includes sleep, nutrition, managing inflammation, improving gut health, all the way to more psycho-spiritual dimensions of our mental health, like our need for community and feeling of service and making a meaningful contribution and having a sense of meaning and purpose in our lives. So there's more that we can do to support our mental health. And I focus there because for those people that the current focus hasn't helped, I want them to know there's so much more that we can do. This is so interesting to me because I am extremely untrusting. I do not trust pharmaceutical companies. I do not trust pharmaceuticals. I've never had to take them in my whole life uh, or I haven't. So as I was approaching this like anxiety diagnosis and what have you, uh, and the pandemic is happening and all this stuff, I'm just like, I'm pretty wound up, let's say. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm just like extremely all over the place. And, and there's been these moments in my life even when, you know, I can, I can relax a bit. And I'm, I remember my daughter, my youngest daughter, I have four kids, who's like, oh, you're smiling, daddy. I'm like, yeah, what? And she's like, oh, yeah, I haven't seen you smile in a really long time. And it's just like heartbreaking for me. So, but where I'm going with this is like, at first, I hoped, and I don't really talk about this publicly that much, but I hoped that cannabis would help because it was legalized here in Canada, which is where I am. I've done research and I can see that the industry is working very hard, very, very hard to try and legitimize it. Like in all the posts I'm reading, they're saying, you know, there are many different types of medicine, medicine like pharmaceuticals and medicine like natural stuff. And they're trying to like label it as medicine. And so um, I went down the road of like hoping that THC could help uh, and it does, but then it doesn't. And that maybe CBD could help and it does, but then it doesn't. And that maybe, you know, I, I lost a lot of weight. I lost 70 pounds and, uh, and, I, and I exercise like hell now. And I focus on my diet for the most part. And I, I work on sleep and I work on hydration and I work on all of these things. But ultimately, I just couldn't shake it. And so finally, I, I went and after two years, contacted my doctor. I met with them and they put me on a medication and I felt like hell. I felt like hell for 10 days. And then I, and then it was like the cloud had lifted and I was like, is this what life could be like? Like, is this how amazing it can be? And I fought and I fought and I fought medication for so long because I just don't trust. And I don't, I just don't trust any of it. And yet it seems to be working. So I feel like there are some people who just want to take the pill because it's the easy answer. But there's also a lot of high achievers who somehow feel like they should be able to grind their way through these things. And, and I was one of them where it's like, I guess I just need more cold baths or I guess I just need more, um, you know, gut bio, whatever, microbiome crap. Or I just need like, like I need to run another 10K or I just like need to do something because I still have this anxiety and I can beat it. And at the end of the day, it's like, oh, 10 milligrams a day of, I don't know what it's called, um, whatever, Ciprolax takes care of everything. So... Do you come across people like me too? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I create people like you. Yeah. I mean, I okay. think that, yeah, no, it's, it's interesting, right? You bring up such an important nuance to this whole issue, which is, first of all, I'm so glad you found a path to support your mental health. This is a huge It's only thing. taken three and a half years. Of, and I had yeah. to, at the end, not even at the end, I turned to my wife a few weeks ago and I said, thank you for being so patient with me because I feel like it's taken me a very long time to kind of get here. Yeah. I'm going to explore two sides of this conversation. One is like why I would steer someone away from meds in the first place. You're the success story, right? Like this was a good medication for you and it's helpful. And so this is great. And the issue is that not everyone has that experience. And in certain ways, I think a lot of depression, anxiety is not a Ciprolax or Lexapro deficiency disorder. And so that's part of the concern is that like, it's not an elegant solution. I really believe in that functional medicine perspective of root cause resolution rather than symptom suppression, that depression, anxiety are not just a thing about you. It's a symptom. It's a constellation of symptoms. It's your body communicating, Hey, something's not right here. So in almost a compulsive way, I like to investigate and figure out what is out of balance. You've really done that work, right? And you did a lot to support balance. And, and I think that you're absolutely right that there's a time and a place for like when you call it, when you say like, we've really maxed out this approach and it hasn't been the strategy to bring relief. Um, and then with meds, some people, like I think what we're missing is informed consent upfront. 
we need to have the full conversation of here's the range of, of possible efficacy for how this is going to play out for you. And here are possible side effects and here's possible long-term effects. And here's what it might be like when you try to get off the medication. And I feel like none of this is a reason that no one should take medication. We just deserve to have all of that information up front when we're making our decision. And then you try it. And if it's helpful, like it is with you, this is great. And then for somebody where it's like, okay, I tried that one, no effect. I tried another one, no effect. We raised the dose. We added an augmentation strategy, no effect, no effect. That's where I really come in and say, hey, I've got some other ideas. Let's work on. And that okay. sounds like hell going through month after month, visit after visit, trying this, trying that. Like it. Yeah. Um, because when I said that it took me like 10 days to get used to this medication, it was horrendous. Yeah. I felt. I felt so bad. I felt so bad. I couldn't work out. My heart was racing. I was super dizzy. I was like, I, three days in, I, I turned to a few people and I said, "If this is if this is my life, then this can't. This is not. This is not going to work for me." Um, yeah. And it and it's scary and it's hopeless. So I I just I I feel um, quite bad for people who go, "Hey doc, I'm having this issue," and they go, "Well, let's try this and let's try this and let's try this and let's try this and let's let's figure it out." And it's going to take eight or nine or ten months of just trying different things, and it's like. Oh gosh, that sounds that sounds horrible. But but it's going to always come back to personal responsibility, right? It's going to come back to like everything that you're suggesting that we couldn't do. All takes work. It all takes effort. It's hard. Most people don't want to do it. They'd rather just have someone come and fix them. No. Yeah, I and mean, I think that that's like even a deeper philosophy that a lot of us have is that feeling of like, you know, someone's coming. <laughs> you know, someone's coming to help, and no one's coming. And it is up to us. And that gets complicated. We're, we're often seeing ourselves as part of that victim, perpetrator, savior triangle. And wherever we see ourselves in that, like it, it, it sticks us in a role rather than recognizing personal responsibility, which is a, is a tricky concept because it can be perceived as denying structural factors, which it, it's not meant to be, right? Or certainly in the way I use it, like personal responsibility is a really empowering and hopeful way of recognizing you're not stuck. And it also needs to be taken in consideration with the fact that we're not all starting from the same place. Like some of us have structural factors impacting our ability to seek out the things that will support our health and barring that every step of the way. And some people have more access to it, more privilege, and we're not all starting from the same place, but it doesn't change the fact that it is at least a pathway to empowerment and hope. And it doesn't always have to be lofty or difficult. Like in my book, I sort of spread it out as like this buffet. It's like, Here's a lot of different things you can do to support your anxiety. Some of them are quite effortful and like what nobody wants to do. I get it. And some of them are like, take magnesium at bedtime. No must, no fuss. Or try a spoonful of coconut oil to keep your blood sugar stable. So some things are very like not a lot of skin off our back, easy to do, affordable, non-invasive, accessible, not very effortful. Sometimes I'm like, deeply reflect on your relationship to alcohol or caffeine. <laughs> or gluten. And no one wants to have that conversation. But I think- Come, come to terms with the fact that you might actually be have addictive uh, personality traits. <laughs> well, so and like all those things I just outlined, those are the false anxiety. Those are the avoidable anxiety where it's really thinking about anxiety as a state that's created from physical imbalance, a stress response to the body. And that's where you want to identify what's causing those unnecessary stress responses and eradicate them. But part of what you're bringing forth, and I'm, I'm even honing in on that conversation you had with your mom at the table. It's like, there's, it's such a hippie way of outlining it, but there's a mind, body, spirit, root causes to our mental health and the false anxiety, avoidable anxiety, that's body. It's the physical. And first we need to recognize that mental health is physical health. What's happening in our physical body impacts our brain and impacts our mental health. We can't overlook that, but it's not everything. And there is also mind and our psycho spiritual health. And that's where trauma, that's where early life attachment patterns come in. And I think about how anxiety in certain respects boils down to, you know, the, the bigger worst case scenario questions of I won't be okay. I won't survive, which I do think when we have a must an exaggerated fear response, a forever living in fear of not being okay. It's either related to trauma or even just to a, a subtler form of not getting our needs met in childhood, where there's a threat to the attachment with the primary caregiver, where we feel on some level, like, and it's not to blame parents. I mean, parenting is impossible. You have four kids, you know this, 
And, you know, parents are themselves wounded from their childhoods and overwhelmed and struggling with their own mental health or their substance issues or their late stage capitalism, like relentless workplaces. And parents are struggling, but we don't always meet our children's needs and they don't need everything. They just need good enough parenting where we validate their reality and we show them that we cherish them and we help co-regulate, help show them how to self-soothe. And sometimes we're not getting those needs met and there can be a threat to the attachment of the primary caregiver. And I think that's a fundamental version of feeling like I am not safe. I will be a babe in the woods abandoned and I might die. And I think that sometimes adult anxiety is tracing directly back to that feeling of abandonment in childhood. Yeah. Um, I, a, f- a few weeks ago, no, no, I guess a few months ago now, I was out for a walk and I was thinking about what scares me and why. I do a lot of overthinking. but. Um, and and ultimately, I ended up sending myself this email where I realized my greatest fear. And I waited a few days and I shared it with my wife. And it makes me feel a little bit silly, though, to say like, it it, it feels like um, pop, like psycho analyst. It feels like I'm just trying to justify something that I should be able to figure out. But, you know, for me, it's like, the greatest fear is I know to do extraordinary things. It's above my capabilities. And I need a lot of other people to help me to, to do this, to collaborate on this amazing thing. And when push comes to shove, they won't be able to deliver or they won't be there for me. And so it'll fall back onto my shoulders to do it all. And I won't be good enough because I need all these people. And so therefore, if I'm not good enough, I'm going to ev- let everyone down. And if I let everyone down, it'll further prove that I'm not capable of doing this big, extraordinary thing. The first time I, I had written that out and thought through those steps, it was like, so uncomfortable to say and like so uncomfortable to put onto paper and then showing it to my wife or what have you. And now it's been a few months and I can realize like, yeah, I don't know what kind of abandonment issues this says. But as I think through these things, as I think through the whole like, oh, I have GAD, there's a name to it, but I don't want to be a victim of it. Oh, I have these fears that are keeping me, but but I'm worried about it. Oh, there's medication available, but I don't trust it. Oh, I can do the all of these other things. Oh, now you've given me a new framework. There's false anxiety and true anxiety <laughs> but but all of it makes me a bit uncomfortable like things aren't that bad like i'm not i, I don't want to be a, a a victim of these things am i just kind of you know am i reading webmd and just thinking i've got this and i've got this and i'm just like i'm just grabbing onto the bits and pieces because it it makes me feel better or do you hit a certain point where you just kind of go like yeah this is I, this is affecting me this is holding me back i need to take steps towards fixing these things in my life. Mm, okay. 10,000 things to say in response to this. So let's see. <laughs> Anything you want. <laughs> I can rein it in and like actually remember the, the four bullet points or so. So let's see. Um, I mean, I think one just early on in there, there is like perhaps a fallacy in the earlier stages of your thinking about this, which is like that we would ever be expected to do anything alone, right? It's always a collaboration. This is what it is to be human. We were not the strongest species. We weren't the fastest species. We don't hunt alone. Like we are the species that really figured out how to cooperate. And I think that's why we have prevailed um, for better or worse. (laughs) And so I think that this is why when we feel held in community and richly interconnected, we feel safe. And when we feel isolated, disconnected, ostracized on some level in our hard wiring, it feels like a matter of life or death. I mean, I suspect that whatever is that early childhood abandonment in some way, perhaps it's that somebody wasn't there for you. Like there was, and and again, this isn't blaming anyone. It's like understanding in context, it's not always easy to meet our kids' needs as parents, but perhaps there was that feeling of like you, you got let down or disappointed. But I think that there's still a fundamental reframe that can happen around what is enough. And, and I think that it's a beautiful aspect of being human, that we each have these unique gifts, unique perspective. I do believe we each have a unique contribution to make. It doesn't have to be grand. You know, I think we are a culture that really celebrates when someone's contribution is exceptional, but mm, I really, as like each passing year, more and more celebrate the people whose contributions are nearly invisible. Right. So like, it's all exceptional. And, and I think that this feeling of enoughness is where we've really done a disservice to the population, especially in places like the U S Canada, all these places with 
great ambition and innovation. And it's a beautiful thing, like what we create with that innovative spirit, but the hustle is relentless. And we internalize this idea of more, 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 better, better. And we have lost a connection to contentment and enoughness. And so let's reframe it slightly, which is that you cannot help but make your unique contribution. You're already doing it. Like, look at what you're doing right now. We're we're having this podcast. Like you're, you're doing, you're making your contribution and you showing up and doing your reasonable best, not your 150% effort, squeeze yourself into a pretzel, squeeze out any potential possibility of failure best, but your reasonable best, something you can feel proud of, but you can do it sustainably. You showing up and doing your reasonable best is enough. And it's infinitely impactful. I feel like you're saying the words that uh, that young Mark needed to hear. (laughs) Hmm. I had this moment when I was watching Encanto, the Disney movie with my kids. I don't know if you saw the movie or not, but Excellent. but my, my wife was crying in the theater. I'm crying in the theater. Actually, everyone in my family except for my son was crying and he's looking around being like, ha ha, I'm not crying. <laughs> but towards the end, without a spoiler, but it's been out for a year. So come on, listeners, catch up already. <laughs> um, you know, towards the end, there's this conversation between the granddaughter and the grandmother, the pressure the grandmother put on the family to be perfect, <laughs> the granddaughter who feel, felt like she didn't belong. And as I'm watching this movie and I'm listening to the script, first of all, I go, this whole movie is a mindset movie, 100% a mindset movie. There's the girl who has to be strong. There's the girl who has to be perfect. There's the girl who doesn't belong. There's the, the family pressure. There's the weird dynamic, 100% mindset. But at the end, the grandmother is saying these words like, this wasn't your burden to carry. This wasn't your fault. How could you have expected to do it? None, I'm sorry I put pressure on you. And, and I, I watched it, closing my eyes, imagining that this was someone telling young me this. And it was like the trippiest experience for me because it hit me so hard to realize that like these were the words that I needed to hear at the time. And you're touching on some of these things as well. And so I don't know if that's some kind of weird therapeutic approach or not, but it, but it helped me to realize like, oh, younger version of me wanted to hear this, wanted the person to, to be the empathetic witness, wanted the person to help me justify that it's not the end of the world and that's okay. No one did, but, but maybe I can. And it's just a past memory and maybe I can let it go and, and all of those types of things. Um, I'm not sure what you think of that. <laughs> I, I mean, uh, yes, to all of that. I really do believe that we can reparent our inner child. I think that we get to do that. I do it with parenting. I try to parent my daughter in some of the ways that I wish I had been parented. And of course I make other mistakes. You know, we yeah. always like compensate. Yeah, yeah, it's like way. the pendulum is going one way or the other. <laughs> But we can do that work with our inner child as well, through journaling, through talking to ourselves. We can tell ourselves what we needed to hear. And this isn't about blame, right? Anytime you try to stand on blame for like who didn't meet our needs in those ways, that ground gets very squishy very quickly because then you see that person in context of the fact that they didn't get their needs met in childhood from their parents who themselves didn't get their needs met. And there's usually trauma upon trauma and unmet needs and disenfranchised populations and you, there's once you consider it in context, all you can do is expand your understanding and sympathy for all the players involved. But um, but we can still talk to our inner child and tell that little person what they needed to hear, and and just to lift some of that shame and blame that we put on ourselves, and to just recognize that we are inherently lovable, infinitely lovable, and we are enough as we are. Mm-hmm. And we're gonna be okay. And then this touches on like this other edge of true anxiety. And this is really kind of like what the book builds toward. There's a lot of focus on false anxiety. I'm very like Mr. Fix it and it's actionable strategies. It's like, do this with your caffeine and your blood sugar and your hormones and your inflammation and your gut and you will be less anxious. But also anxiety is our fear of dying. And that's legit too. And I think that for me, at least giving myself permission to seek and to ask the bigger questions has softened those edges, has made that fear of the worst case scenario and death and loss feel a little bit less absolute. And I think that that's also a worthy path to take up this mountain of feeling less anxious. It's not right for everyone. Some people just really do not, it doesn't resonate for them to to open up to any spiritual way of thinking. And that's valid too. I don't have a horse in this race. I don't need people to come to a certain conclusion. I just want them to give themselves permission to seek. But for some of us to contemplate the possibility 
that this universe is something is occurring here vastly beyond our comprehension. For me, at least, that softens the edges of what I fear most. I've struggled with this one because I had Dr. Anna Lemke, uh, the author mm-hmm. of Dopamine Nation on the podcast. And in her book, she does a big deep dive on AA and just what makes certain structures work in certain ways. And I know that faith is a big, a big part of kind of like step one or maybe two or three. I don't, I don't know the steps. Um, but, but I've struggled with this because, um, you know, my wife and I, we, we used to be Christian and we would go to a church and, and what have you. And then we stepped away from that. And I know that you, you may not have a pony in the race. I don't have a pony in the race. I don't, part, part of my issue is that every religion's like, like my religion's the right one and all of you guys are wrong. And it's like, well, okay, but, but how do we come to spirituality? How do we come to faith? How do we, and, and maybe you're like, I don't know, Mark, like go, go talk to someone else about this, but you just touched on the, the psycho-spiritual side of things. How do we, how do we do this out of the context of religion? I haven't figured that out yet. There's this exercise that I talk about in the book um, called shamanic shaking, where it's something I learned when I studied integrative medicine. And there's like, it's used as a way of completing the stress cycle. This is a long-winded answer. And I'm not even sure where I'm going with this. I love it. Let's, Let's see where we go. Let's see where we go. So when I studied integrative medicine, we talked about completing the stress cycle, that we have all this stress And we need a way of discharging the excess adrenaline and telling our nervous system, the threat has passed. It's now safe to be in the body. And we draw upon what animals do. An animal of prey has a life or death encounter with a predator. And if it survives afterward, it shakes. That seems to be how it completes the stress cycle. And so we socialized human creatures have no shortage of stressors coming at us all the time, but we don't typically shake after every stressful email or meeting. Um, or conversation with an in-law. And so we need to have some practice and it can be exercise. It could be dancing. It could be journaling, crying. It could be chanting. I actually really do love shaking. And part of what I love is I put on this shamanic drum music. So it helps to sync up the brain with a theta wave pattern. And that is inherently relaxing. But then I close my eyes and I let my body be floppy. And a lot of messaging comes in exactly that's like so here's... for listeners, I'm just like, I'm starting to like shake. <laughs> I'm just gonna do floppy. That. So at first, I think here's how I should move. Here's what would look normal. Here's what would look cool. Here's what would be appropriate. And then eventually, when you continue to listen, your body tells you, like, well, here's the way I want to move. And it reminds me of childbirth, where there was this strong instinct in my body of like, here's how I need to move right now. And mm-hmm. I think that we get a lot of messaging that tells us, well, here's what spirituality should be. Here's what religion should be. Here's who you should worship and how you should worship and what you should do and what you shouldn't do. And, you know, it's maybe the truth of God filtered through very mortal man, patriarchal ideas. And so can we get rid of that messaging, stay still, stay listening. And at a certain point, your body tells you how it wants to shake. And I think that we need some kind of, you know, you pick the venue for this. The set and setting is important. Something that helps you connect to awe. And then you're there and you stay still long enough to hear what emerges. And so it almost becomes like a a, a meditative state of movement. Like there's there's a moment when I run where my legs are just numb enough. My breathing is just locked in. The heart rate is just pushing enough. The sweat is just enough, like where like I almost get this like numbness wash over me. And I love that feeling of like, this is uncomfortable and it hurts, but everything just kind of falls into place and becomes kind of numb. Dude, like, I don't know if you run or not, but is that what you mean where it's just like, it's just kind of happening and you disassociate it or? I realized I didn't make it very clear that I was using that whole thing as a very long-winded analogy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> I was trying to figure out how to shake. I'm like, okay, so 12 minutes, we're going to put on a drum beat. That, and I'm like, I'm like, I'm like getting tactical here. I love the way your brain works and that you made it make sense. But so basically, you know how to move once you stop, when you filter out the ideas of here's how I've been taught to move. Here's how I think I should move. Here's what looks cool. And then your body tells you, well, here's what I need to do to actually excavate stress, actually get things out okay. of my connective tissue and release it. The body knows what it needs. So similarly with our spiritual practice, 
I think we do need to do a little bit of quieting all of the messaging that we've been bombarded with for our whole lives, sit in stillness in some kind of awe-inspiring setting, whether that is a church or a forest or a starry night or surfboard in the ocean, or, you know, or, or you're just hanging out with a baby or a pet, or you're listening to music, but you find something that inspires awe. And then you stay still and you stay curious. And in sort of the words, I think of Rilke, you live the questions, you just stay with it, open, open palm. And I think that what emerges eventually is something that's unique to ourselves. And it's just what feels true for us. So all this is to say, I think we do need to do some deconditioning. We have a lot of messaging around what worship, what religion, what spirituality needs to look like. And as also on the other side, we have messaging right now around atheism. You know, we have it all. <laughs> we, and, and I think who knows what's our personal truth? We have to find it through stillness and silence. So earlier you mentioned that a lot of the way that we look at anxiety and treatment and classification uh, comes down to this fixed idea, right? And and Carol Dwick uh, with with a fantastic book um, called Is it called Mindset? I think it's called Mindset. I don't know. You don't know. She talks. She introduces growth versus fixed mindsets. And, oh, the original. And, yeah, I don't know what it's called. I I think it is. I think it's Mindset. It's the back. It's somewhere back there, but uh, it's on my bookshelf. But uh, this idea of like a fixed mindset, which which I realized, wow, it's like growing up. I was surrounded by it. And I think it used to be the norm. The idea that you were born with certain traits, you had certain skills, you had, you, 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 you had a certain IQ, you could achieve certain levels, you had certain ways of thinking, certain successes. If you have a heart condition, that is your heart condition. If you have depression, that is yours for life. And it's just like this fixed mindset, which shows itself in kids and in adults by saying like, oh, if I made a mistake, I must be terrible. As opposed to just, oh, I made a mistake. What can I learn from this? Or uh, I didn't do... As you know, my my son wanted to learn how to play hockey because he saw people whizzing around at a hockey game, and he said, "That's awesome." Step one is let's learn how to skate, and he falls a lot and hates it. He thinks because I can't skate instantly, because I'm not as good as a hockey player, I will never get better, and I must not be good. And if I'm not good, I can never achieve my. So that's the fixed mindset. Now, what's interesting is I've never heard anyone speak in terms in in, in these terms in terms of how we can approach anxiety as well. So if everyone else is looking at anxiety as this fixed thing, which is I have it, I have to deal with it. How do I get rid of the symptoms? But you're suggesting it's this more of this growth mindset approach. What are some of the, and you've listed a few already, but what are some of the easy things we can knock out just to make our lives better? Exactly. Yeah. And so, and I, I compulsively need to even touch upon a few other things that you said. Yes. The, the, the growth mindset versus the fixed mindset. And I love this in childhood, how a lot of parents just through the, the sheer fact that parenting is, is survival um, we use shame un unconsciously. It really is, isn't it? It's just but like you're trying is. to get through the week or the month. <laughs> Truly, but unwittingly, we use shame as a device to get through the day and sort of like, you know, be a good girl and do this. And we don't realize that that what the child internalizes is like, if I don't do that, I'm not good. And so these days with people like Becky Kennedy and her book, Good Inside, and there's a whole new movement of like, you're good, you're good inside. You're, you're a good kid exercising some bad behavior in this moment because you're having a hard time, but it really doesn't label you as bad or something to be ashamed of. It's you're having a hard time right now. Let's support that. Let's validate the fact that it is hard and, and move through that. And so, and even just talking about this idea, we have a genetic chemical imbalance. We have been really sold this idea that our genes are set in stone. And even that is wigglier and more plastic than we realize. We are starting to appreciate epigenetics, which is to say our DNA is in a dynamic with the environment at all times. It's being methylated, which will impact how our genetic material is expressed. And it's not just our DNA in our cells today, in our bodies, in this world. Our DNA, the, the exact DNA that became our bodies, that became us, was physically present in the follicles, in the ovary in our mom when she was a fetus in our maternal grandmother's womb. And so the DNA- Whoa, whoa hold on. I was like, I was following you and I'm doing the, I'm like <laughs> doing a little visualization in my head. So our DNA is present in the follicles of our grandmother's womb? When, when, when a baby girl is born, she yeah. already has all of the follicles that go on to become the eggs that go on to become her potential children. And so we like half of Mark, 
half of Ellen existed in the ovary of our mom as a fetus in the womb of our maternal grandmother. So our DNA has been in a dynamic with this environment for two generations. Well, and we're and we're seeing, and I can't reference studies because I'm not scientific that way. But we're, but I believe people have written in books that I've read <laughs> that the things that happen even generations past. The reason that that perhaps alcoholism can be something that that might or addictive nature could be something that's hereditary. It's like stuff that was happening maybe 60, 70, 80 years ago might be impacting people today. And the decisions we're making today could be impacting generations to come. Exactly. And it's one thing to say, oh, we know that this baby was born after there was a great famine and therefore their metabolism is such that they're more likely to hoard calories and fat. Um, But it's another thing still to say, well, generational trauma and perhaps epigenetics are our material basis for how we are passing on trauma that our ancestors have gone through. And so all of this is to say, we're plastic, we're in a dynamic with the environment and we've been impacted by the past and we should honor that and tell that story. But we also can impact ourselves today and we can impact our future offspring and even our grandchildren and future generations. And and I think that we just need to recognize how plastic these things are. And mental health, we've been handed down this story that it's your genetic chemical imbalance and you're stuck. It's you, it's your destiny. And we don't need that story. That is not a helpful narrative. There's certain times when it's helpful to be like, ah, giving it a name helps me, it grounds me. Um, Knowing that there's a pill that helps this helps me, it grounds me. That's all well and good, but there's too many people stuck in the shadow of this. It's not actually helpful for them. So that's where we need to expand our definition and recognize our mental health is impacted by our sleep, by our nutritional status, micronutrient status, um, inflammation levels, the health of our digestive tract, our hormone balance, and then all of those psychospiritual factors. And just to kind of bang out a couple of those quick wins, let's perhaps start with sleep. And um, sleep You mean You mean focus on sleep? Oh my goodness. (laughs) It's, um, I think that like sleep is certainly our best medicine. When we're talking about mental health, people are always like, well, I don't sleep well. And it's because of the depression, because of the anxiety. We say like, I I have insomnia because of my anxiety. And that's valid, but it's a two-way street of communication. And basically our anxiety, our depression definitely does impact our sleep, but our sleep impacts every single mental health diagnosis under the sun. And it's the easier entry point. So let's fix sleep because you can sleep that in a matter of weeks. And that's easier than seven years of psychotherapy on the couch to fix the depression. (laughs) It's cheaper too. (laughs) It's much cheaper. And so, and fixing sleep, I think there are a few caveats. Like I don't find it easy to fix perimenopausal or postmenopausal sleep, shift labor sleep, jet lag sleep, and certain sleep disorders. Those are trickier pickles. But for the rest of us, common day-to-day insomnia is very fixable. And it relates to the fact that our circadian rhythm, our sleep-wake cycle is designed to function on a, under a certain set of circumstances. And those circumstances were guaranteed on the proverbial savanna of evolution. It needed daylight during the day and darkness at night. A couple other small things, but mostly it's about those light cues. And in the modern environment... So don't watch scary, addictive TV shows right before bed and and have all your lights on and eat all this crazy stuff and all these other things, right? (laughs) Not if you want to sleep well. And and it's actually really fixable. And we struggle so much because once we're like in bed, tossing and turning and we're like, oh, I can't fall asleep and this is terrible. It's very, everyone's like, what do I do then? How do I help myself fall back asleep when I'm up in the middle of the night? And it's like, well, I can give you a couple of lame recommendations, but it's not going to really solve it. The way we solve our sleep is what we do at all points during the day and the consistency of our sleep schedule over time. So a few things. One, getting healthy after being basically an overweight guy for most of my life. Um, I've learned tons and tons of lessons and it's it's amazing. Um, it's the most amazing thing in the world. Like I got into a, a bit of a disagreement with some people who are like, oh, you can't use the word fat. And I was like, I can call myself fat, the old version of me. Um, you know, you can't have these high standards because it makes people feel bad. It's like, yeah, it's tough work and I know. So I won't even touch on that because I get into trouble for what I believe having my experiences. But I will say that there's a certain point where where I was developing core strength and I started lifting weights where I didn't even realize how every other aspect of my life just became easier. You know, carrying groceries in, super, super simple. 
yeah. uh, picking things up, running up the stairs, doing some work, having to paint the ceiling and like, like doing some kind of weird thing on a ladder where I'm like trying to reach. And suddenly I'm like, Oh, I can do this for 10 minutes on one foot. Okay, cool. Like, you know, let, we don't, we don't even have to talk about like sex and other things like that. Every <laughs> aspect of my life became better when I developed stronger core, when I developed my cardio and when I feel better. And I can never go back because it's just like, now that I know, I can't go back. And whenever I focused on my sleep, I feel like the same thing has happened. When I focused on my hydration, the same thing happens. Like I typically walk outside for two hours a day, getting the fresh air. I suddenly feel better. And when I don't, it's like, why don't I? And it's, it's like so uncomfortable for me to try and convince people that if you just do this, you will feel so much better and it will impact every other aspect of your life. But no one can come along and, and make you do this. Like no one can help you with it. No one will do it for you. And you just kind of have to suck it up and do it. And I just wish people would taste a little bit of the benefit so that way they'd realize how much every other aspect of their life could be improved if they just focus on these things. We are creatures of inertia. And so, you know, there's inertia with like maintaining good core strength. And there's inertia with feeling like when we feel like I just want to eat junk food and sit around. And oh, I do that inertia. too. <laughs> <laughs> but I think also um, it is. I'm up against this quite a lot, which is someone is saying, I am debilitated by my anxiety, by my depression. I'm eating all this junk food. I'm staying on screens late at night. I'm not sleeping. I'm not moving. And when I come in and say like, well, you're going to address your anxiety and your depression by eating better, moving your body, getting more sleep. Like it's people hear that as almost invalidating of how real their problems are and insulting. And it, they, they often feel like I don't get how depressed and anxious they are because they think I'm coming along with a soft science solution thinking they're just a little depressed or anxious when in fact they have serious depression or anxiety. So they need a real hard science solution. So that's the paradigm that we actually need to fix because, you know, they're like, no, like if I'm like, well, you need to address your sleep and eat better and move your body. They're like, well, you don't understand. Like this is real depression, real anxiety. Yeah. yeah. Like one, one of the criticisms of your book is, is literally this quote. You want to cure your anxiety? That's easy. Just stop doing everything considered normal in your day-to-day -day life. Cut out foods, throw away your phone, go to bed early, be perfect in all areas. Then you'll sort it out. And, and, and that's like, that's, that's a criticism is, that's been written about this book. But I think that that's false. Like I'm saying the exact opposite. Like, yes, you actually probably do have to change some areas of your life. And yes, you probably do have to change some of your foods. And you probably do have to change your schedule. You probably do have to sleep more. And if you do all of these things, the question always comes back to me, like, do you want to feel better or not? Do you want to be healthy or not? Do you want to spend the rest of your life? And ultimately, why I started taking medication was I knew that future me had this figured out. Mm. Future Mark, five years, 10 years from Mark, had this figured out. He, There's no way that future me would keep living this way. Like, what an idiot future me would be if, if I'm going to spend the next five or 10 years dealing with this stuff. So he has it figured out. And then I went, how did he figure it out? Let's try some things. And I, I literally tricked myself into doing it. But the criticism is like, oh, you, you want me to change who I am? Yes, we want you to become better. <laughs> no? I feel like it's always worthwhile to come back to the phrase like, well, how's that working out for you? You know, and I, I have uh, so many people push back and say, like, your solution isn't the solution to, to depression, and anxiety, like, you know, mine is, it's the meds, it's all this. And this. I'm like, well, how's that working out for you? And if it's working out, great. <laughs> and if it isn't, let's try a different tack. That's all I'm suggesting. I'm not saying my book is the only strategy to support anxiety. I think we just need more approaches up this mountain. We have a consensus approach with therapy, with meds. And if that's working out for people, great. They don't need my book, but there's a lot of people for whom that's not working out. And I'm like, well, let's try this tack. And I think my friend, Britt Frank, she wrote a book called The Science of Stuck. And she had a great way of putting it. It's just choose your heart. And when people are like, well, you're telling me to like decrease caffeine and not drink as much and go to bed earlier and move my body and like eat well, it's hard. And I'm like, it is. I know I do this too. I find it incredibly difficult to do this. It's a lot of work. <laughs> it is. <laughs> I found it harder, me and my body to have polycystic ovary syndrome, IBS, depression, migraines, joint pain, autoimmune conditions. That for me was harder. So every time I'm at a restaurant and I'm like, is it gluten-free? I don't like that hard. It's not my favorite, but it's so much better than how much pain I was in before. And I will choose this hard any day. 
And so I think that I just want people to recognize this is a different pathway. And if they haven't found a path, if they feel like it's been a series of dead ends, there's a different strategy to try. And you put in effort that's commensurate or proportional to how much you're suffering. And if you're suffering quite a lot, let's roll up our sleeves and get to work. And if you're just suffering a little bit, try one or two small strategies. It's a buffet. You reach for what resonates and what feels accessible. Um, But I think that throughout the book, I'm very emphatic about the fact that the idea is not to do this perfectly because that actually ends up being counter therapeutic. Perfectionism in general is a great recipe for anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. So I know. It's to really, I think, I think perfectionist traits is the term that, that we use, isn't it? <laughs> and so it's not a state at least. So I think that we need to soften and loosen our grip and basically rather than always giving our power outward and saying, well, this book told me to do it this way, or this person told me to do it this way. It's like, uh -uh. like drown out all that noise. We need to tap back into the internal compass where our body will tell us yes or no. And that's a much more useful way of navigating these choices. The only thing I'll say is, as we wrap this up, I mean, this has been an amazing conversation because this is something I've struggled with. And it may sound to the listeners like I have a lot of answers. I don't. I don't have answers really at all. I've just I've spent three or four years really focused on this because I know how much it cost me. I can look back now that I've had some breakthroughs and I realize what a shadow version of my life I was living. And I realize how much this was costing me. And I also realize how much self-sabotage I do and um, how much I kind of like being a victim and I kind of like having excuses because then I don't have to quite work so hard at this because it is a lot of work. But a few weeks ago, I realized as an entrepreneur and as a leader of my team and my family and, and everything, I realized that really at the end of the day, my number one job is to be adaptable, to be uh, uh, decisive, and to be confident. Ultimately, as a leader, if I can be adaptable and I can be decisive and I can be confident, when maybe other people aren't confident or maybe when the decision's really hard to make or when I'd rather just do the same thing all the time. Like, that's the greatest thing I can do as a leader. And I realized, and as I looked at my schedule and, 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 my, and some things I did, some things I'm eating, the Reddit threads that are hurting me, like if it's, if it's keeping me stuck from being adaptable or if it's making me worried and indecisive or it's robbing me of my confidence, I, I'm literally not being the person that I could be. And so I just started to ask myself, how much is this costing me? Like, like these self-sabotaging things or, um, or you know, the wanting to be a victim or whatever. Like it's just, is it, it's, it's costing me because I can't show up and I can't do things and I can't move as quick and, I, and, and all of those things. And so I don't know if you have recommendations like that, but for me, being able to just make things like as simple and crystal clear as possible so that way I can step back and go, you want to go ahead and... Um, you know, you want to go ahead and, and drink too much. Um, okay. But you're going to feel like garbage for three days. And it's going to actually, uh, wouldn't you feel more proud waking up the next day going like, I feel great. I didn't just waste a whole day. I can go for a run. I'm so strong. I didn't drink too much. Yay. Like, wouldn't you rather show up that way? Or would you rather show up going like, Oh, I did it again. You know, yeah. fuck you, you, you idiot. You're the worst. Blah, blah, blah. Like, I don't know. I try, to, I try to make things very black and white so that way yeah. I can not screw up like that. So I want to touch on self-love and core strength. So, <laughs> so self-love. I think that the framing that I have found most helpful is when I learned from my friend Kimberly Ann Johnson. She wrote a book called, um, I think it's called Called the Wild. And she also wrote a book uh, that I believe was called The Fourth Trimester. And she explained she was like going to go do a Wim Hof cold plunge retreat. <laughs> and she was like, why am I doing this? Why am I submerging myself in this freezing water? And then she's like, oh, and I realized because I love myself. And to me, that's actually the most powerful framing is why are we doing anything? Why am I having this glass of wine right now? Or why am I saying, is this item on the menu gluten-free? If the answer is because I love myself, then green light, go forth. It's the right choice in that moment. And if the answer is some kind of muddled other thing of like, because I don't deserve to be happy because everything sucks because I'm a victim because nothing's fair da, 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 or like I want to punish myself. If it's anything else kind or, of. Or perhaps we just like that numbing feeling I was talking about earlier when I yeah. run a lot. <laughs> then, so if it's anything else, then, you know, you pause and you reconsider. 
But I think that using to navigate these things, a compass of like, well, why are you doing something? Is it because you love yourself? If it is, go for it. And I think core strength is a really interesting example of a keystone habit change. We need these keystone changes, whether it's you build core strength or you start flossing every day, somewhere that you start to develop positive inertia, but also you witness yourself holding yourself to a commitment. And once you witness yourself doing that once, it builds self-efficacy and you can start to do it more often. And core strength is really interesting in that I think so much of how we hold our body, it's in a two-way communication with our mind. And you know, you can picture Charlie Brown when he's down, he's like, rawr, rawr, and he's like hunched over. Rawr, rawr, rawr. And there's a body habitus, there's a body position to I'm feeling down or I'm feeling self-conscious or I'm feeling arrogant. Like there's body positions to all of this. And it's a two-way street. You can feel that way. And then your body reflects that, but you can also start at the level of the body. Feeling strong from your literal core is a great way to feel centered and powerful and confident. And I think that giving ourselves the, you know, putting some effort into posture, into breathing through our nose, into holding our jaw softly, into a soft gaze. I think all of this has an impact on how we feel and how we think. And sometimes the easier entry point is from the physical body, the start there. And then that can track up to how we feel. And it becomes a virtuous cycle. It becomes self-perpetuating. That as you just listed each of those things, I realized I was adjusting myself. <laughs> when you're like soft jaw, I'm like, ooh, loosen my jaw. Yeah, my eyes. <laughs> oh my goodness. What a remarkable conversation. And the book that we've been referencing this whole time, of course, is The Autonomy of Anxiety, Understanding and Overcoming the Body's your response. Um, now, before I let you go, one last question. What what didn't I ask you that I really should have? You asked me great questions. What did I not answer that I really should have <laughs> is, is those actionable strategies. Um, I feel like I, I've kept it very big picture philosophical. So maybe we close with like a couple of bullet points of yeah. actionable Yeah, pearls. rapid fire us. How rapid do we make fire. our lives a little bit less anxious? So let's say, let's improve your sleep in three steps. One is get a pair of blue blocking glasses, put them on at sunset, wear them till bedtime. You can get the kind that like just look like normal glasses, or you can get the kind that look like you're about to do metallurgy. It's your choice, but something that will block blue spectrum light, protect your melatonin and, and protect your circadian rhythm. Keep the phone somewhere else in your home when you're sleeping, not on your bedside table. And then try for an earlier bedtime, something in the ballpark of three hours after sunset. We get overtired when we push past that point. There's a point when we're perfectly tired where it's our sweet spot and it's easy to fall asleep and stay asleep. And it's a little different. We're all different chronotypes, but around three hours after sunset. And when we push past that, we get overtired and then we're tired, but wired and it's hard to fall asleep. I had to let go of the judgment, honestly. Like I, I would start to fall asleep if I was really tired. It's like 8 p.m. and and I'd start to fall asleep and I go, it's not bedtime yet. Your kids are still awake. You can't go to sleep now. And um, it took me like, it took me a long time to be like, and my, everybody knows now it's like, I go to bed around between nine and 10. I fall asleep. I don't care if it's early. I don't care if you're going to laugh at me or make fun of me. I get up at 4.45 for the most part. And, and anytime before five, I feel pretty good. Um, and, uh, but the biggest thing was, was me telling myself, because as a kid, you're just like, you want to stay up, you want to stay up, you want to stay up. Um, you know, you can't go to bed at 7.30. It's 7.30. That's ridiculous. <laughs> so sometimes I'm so tired. I'm, I'm like falling asleep, but I'm like, no, it's not bedtime yet. So there's like this weird judgment or story we even tell ourselves around sleep. Yeah. Yep. Giving ourselves permission. I agree completely. Physiologic fixes for anxiety. Keep your blood sugar stable. If you can do that with a blood sugar stabilizing diet, great. More healthy fats, more protein, less sugar, refined carbohydrates and alcohol. If that's too hard, take a spoonful of something like coconut oil or almond butter and give yourself a safety net of stable blood sugar, which can then blunt any superimposed blood sugar crash. That'll keep your blood sugar stable and it avoids unnecessary stress responses and unnecessary anxiety. Um, caffeine, not here to shame coffee, but there is a lot of bioindividuality. So if you're sensitive to caffeine, just push it a little earlier in the day. Maybe you decrease gradually the overall amount that you consume. Keep the ritual if you love the ritual, but you don't necessarily need that much milligramage of caffeine. Um, alcohol is its own whole big fun topic, but basically recognize we like it because it gives us a rush of GABA, the neurotransmitter that's calming, but in an effort to maintain homeostasis and ultimately to preserve survival, 
our brain converts that GABA to a neurotransmitter called glutamate, which is excitatory. And that's why we have anxiety. That's why we get anxious and irritable the day after we've been drinking. And it also interrupts our sleep. So you'll be less anxious with less alcohol consumption. It's easier said than done, but that's a, that's a line of inquiry to open up with yourself and then fix your gut. And that's a whole process unto itself. Remove what's irritating your gut. Seed oils are a good place to start. Add in what soothes the gut. Bone broth is a really good place to start and then create the conditions for the gut to heal, which really comes down to rest. And we should all have a squatty potty. <laughs> Throw that in there at the end. <laughs> no affiliation. Just a fan. A squatty yeah. potty or or just get a stool, I guess, right? Yeah, although I've tried them all. I, I like the squatty potty. For $24, it solves the problem. <gasps> I, <laughs> I did not realize that that would be the final word of this episode. But we'll we'll leave it there. Get yourself <laughs> a squatty <laughs> potty. It will heal you of anxiety. That is not a direct quote. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, and final question for you at the end of the day, what does it all come down to? Um, so there's no way to say this without it being so cliche and sophomore. I love, I love all of that stuff. Hit me yeah. with it. So I do think that life is a bit of a take-home test. And like you can Google the answer. You can Google it. It's love. That's the answer to the test. But you get a good grade on this if you write the essay demonstrating your understanding of that answer. And I think oh my that's how, goodness. That's how we I live our lives. I've never heard anyone say anything like that before. I love that so much. And I'm getting a B minus currently. Just don't get me wrong. I'm oh, on the, this. on the love side. <laughs> <laughs> on the explanation though. Wow, that, that hit me. Like, <laughs> like, yeah, like, especially as a high achiever, it's like, I want the answer. I want the answer. I want the answer. But, but having the answer and going ahead and getting the perfect test, but not having learned it, not having experienced it, not having been able to figure it out and go off and do this on your own and replicate it time and time again, did you really get the answer? And I feel like that's what you're saying about life. I, I think we're here to do many things, but I think part of it is that we're here to learn about love and to learn how to be love. And my partner talks a lot about this thing of like, what's going to happen ultimately with the universe? And some people theorize heat death. Like we just become so far apart and disconnected that there, I, I cannot explain this. I don't understand these concepts, but there isn't enough heat to keep the whole thing going. Like, I think we need to desperately fight for our relationships. We need to stay connected. We need to push past all the ways that it triggers us, all the ways that's challenging. I'll mention again, I'm getting a B minus at this, but we need to keep fighting for love and for our relationships. I think that's the main event of what's happening here. And it ain't easy. 